At Five Star Bank, community is at the heart of what we do. Every day we strive to have thoughtful solutions for our customers and help our communities prosper. Honest dialogue about the issues affecting the region is vitally important to that prosperity. We are proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. With the debt ceiling crisis only days behind us, the nation is still attempting to grasp how close to the brink of a financial catastrophe we came. Many of us outside of Washington are beginning to wonder whether our leaders have lost the ability to solve our nation's problems and plan for our country's future. House Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi joins us today on Studio Sacramento to share her insights from the debt crisis fight her thoughts on Congress's ability to do the work of the American people, and her own journey as America's first female speaker of the House and one of America's preeminent political leaders. So you're in town today to talk about a conference uh, or to be a part of a conference. Yes. What's going on? Well, the first thing we did as soon as the, the vote was taken and the president signed the bill to open government and, and uh, end of the potential default of our full faith and credit uh, was to come to Sacramento at the invitation of Congresswoman Doris Matsui uh, to have a, a meeting with hundreds of women here about our agenda, our economic agenda for women and families. When women succeed, America succeeds. Uh, because even though there's that uh, debate in Washington, we cannot let that uh, the opportunity be missed uh, to make progress for the American people. And as I say, if women succeed, America Amer succeeds. And, and those issues have always been at the forefront of, of your career. Yes. And today, what is it that you're most proud of that uh, has given opportunity to America's women, uh, both today's and tomorrow's? Well, there's absolutely no question that uh, the Affordable Care Act, uh, which enables women to have a life, a healthier life, the liberty to change jobs, be self-employed, to, uh, to start a business, to change jobs, to move, to do whatever they want, not be chained by, um, uh, chain, job locked by a policy, instead to be free to follow their passion, life, have healthier life liberty to pursue their happiness. And of course, for women, the, the change is drastic. So that would be uh, the biggest issue. Uh, there are many issues, though, that relate uh, to enabling women to, the power of women to be unleashed. And our, our women's agenda, economic agenda, when women succeed, America succeeds, are about equal pay in the workplace, raising the minimum wage, about pay fairness, Secondly, about paid sick leave, which was really important to men and women. Of course, for families. For families, mm -hmm. and also uh, for affordable quality uh, child care. That, I think, is the most uh, um, is an issue that we really have to take you, hand. You um, referenced uh, the Affordable Care Act, what's yes. known as Obamacare, and I, it was at the center of the crisis we just averted. That issue, why do you think that that is such a flashpoint in this country? Well, I think it's because a half a billion dollars was spent by the insurance industry and other anti-government ideologues uh, to undermine and misrepresent what is in the Affordable Care Act. Uh, it is, stands right there as a pillar of economic and health security for America's families. Social Security, Medicare, affordable the Affordable Health Care, I call it the uh, Affordable are you Care Act. Are you worried at all because of its, its really rocky launch, though, that it's, it's taking on water? No, I don't. I'm not worried about that. I don't think the launch has been, it hasn't been rocky in California or many of the states that had their own state exchanges. It has had technical um, uh, problems with, uh, with the national plan, but not to do with the program or the initiative or what it means to people. So they have to fix the technology and they will do that. Uh, but it not, not, that won't stand in the way of it making a big difference in the lives of the American people. We're very excited about right. it. it the, the crisis that was just averted, it, it feels a little bit like the movie Groundhog Day because we've been here it before. It is, you're right. Yeah, we've been here before. Why does this keep happening, Leader Pelosi? Well, it happened uh, two years ago uh, when um, we had this discussion about 
uh, the budget and we came very dangerously close to defaulting on full faith and credit. Uh, because two things that these two times had in common was that the Republicans had made a proposal. When the president accepted it, they said, never mind. And that was unfortunate. The same thing has happened now. They've tried to use the Affordable Care Act as a reason to shut down government. Whatever you think of the Affordable Care Act, take it up in the normal legislative process. But you can't say, I'm shutting down government. 16 days, the cost of $25 billion to our economy, 0.6 percent, uh, uh, 0.6 uh, downturn in our GDP growth and uh, many jobs, and not to even bring in the fact that 800,000 people were furloughed. So it, it, it either, you know, I think it's really important for the American people and my Republican colleagues to understand what the cost of that tenter tram, uh, temper tantrum was, $25 billion. Maybe they didn't know, but I certainly think they would care if they did. It, it, it raises an issue, though. People out in the country outside of Washington, maybe including, I'll assume Washington as well, people are increasingly in, in barbershop or kitchen table conversations getting worried that somehow something is broken with our system and that we don't have the ability as a nation to, for, to yeah. move forward on our problems. What can, you t what can you tell us about what's really going on? Back? Well, what I would say is what I say to my Republican friends, take back your party. The, Republic, the name Republican, which is a distinguished name in uh, government and politics in America, the grand old party accomplished many good things for our country, great things, has been hijacked by some extremist anti-government ideologues in the Congress of the United States. And that's why you see the conflict within the Republican Party there saying, no, we can't go to this place, but others who insist on going there. So the conflict is within the Republican Party. And I would just say, if Republicans would take back their party, and it's a large number in the Congress. You know, they say, oh, it's a fringe of, of Tea Party. Well, 144 members of Congress, Republican members of Congress voted to continue the shutdown of government the other night and to default on the full faith and credit of the United States of America. That's a lot of members. When, would the other side, though, in making the charge of uh, saying that the Democrats are as unwilling to negotiate on any of their priorities as we are on well, ours. We don't Would that know be fair? We don't know what their priorities are because really the party has been captured by anti-government ideologues. So no government, minimize government, make it very, very limited. So on issues like clean air, clean water, food safety, public safety, public education, public housing, public transportation, public health, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, if you don't believe in a public-private partnerships there, then um, you're not going to come to agreement. Now, I don't paint all of the Republicans in Congress with that brush, but the, the element there that is wagging the dog is really what is preventing some serious negotiation. We hope that a lesson has been learned by them, and as we go to the table with the full scrutiny of the public, the one good, I don't even think it's worth it, but the one good thing that came out of it is the public is focused now, more aware of what the choices are, and, and uh, uh, so we'll see how that debate goes. And I think the public, the public awareness will improve the dialogue and the product that comes out of it. So uh, this is, uh, from your perspective, this is a sea change in terms of just sort of attitudes of the people coming to Washington. Because an observer might say that, you know, when you put good people into a, into a bad system, bad results happen. And mm -hmm. most people say, well, my congressperson is good, and they're decent, and they want to work towards well, many solutions. of them are. But it seems like once people get under the dome and get back in Washington, somehow things just kind of break down. Well, this is a recent development. Uh, it had its roots in the Gingrich years in the 90s when they impeached the president, shut down government, impeached the president. That was not, uh, shall we say, the regular order of governance in our country and these are some of it was we were very respectful of President Bush when we had the majority and he was president uh, they don't want pre this president to succeed so that's part of their motivation but they're comfortable with that because they don't believe in, in the government role now um, again this isn't all Republicans and these aren't the Republicans you know outside of Washington and it isn't many of them in Washington but it is enough of them uh, to uh, uh, wag the dog, shall we say, call the shot. 16 days of a government shutdown, all that time placing in doubt
the full faith and credit of the United States of America. That's a luxury our country cannot afford. I don't care what your beliefs are. Take it up in the regular normal course of this is a legislative debate of ideas, but don't say I'm going to shut down government if you don't do it my way. Their claim is, is that they're trying to save the country from destruction and that because of the fact that at least from the democratic side of the equation that there can be no discussions on entitlement reform, no, cutting spending. That's not true. Not true? That's not true. That's not true. President Obama has entitlement reform in his budget. He did when the Republicans uh, refused to accept their own offer two years ago. So that's just, it's, it's simply mm -hmm. not true. But the fact is, I don't really think they're serious about uh, entitlement reform either, because if, if they want to charge us with that, if they were, they would say, let's put it on the table with uh, revenue and say, what is a budget that comes, uh, reduces the deficit in a balanced way, that subjects every dollar we spend to the harshest scrutiny so that the taxpayer is getting his or her money's worth as we meet the needs of the American people. And if we need more revenue, uh, that we would close the loopholes for special interest uh, who are getting big, ta like $38 billion for big oil as an incentive to drill when they're gonna make a trillion dollars in profit drilling. It, it, it doesn't make sense. So, so, um, uh, so that is, you know, that va uh, values debate is a really an important one. It's been as going on since our country began, what the budget is and what the role of government is, but it hasn't been at the place of, I'm gonna shut government down if you don't do what and, I and want. And that's really the concern, which is that it used to be, it seemed like that people had common objectives, regardless of party. We just right. had different methods. No. Today, it doesn't even come across that there's consensus on what the objective should be. Is that, is that accurate? Well, if you're saying that the Republicans don't share the values of most of the American people, I would say that I wouldn't paint all Republicans with that brush, but I would say those I'm sure in they Congress, disagree with that. <laughs> well, no, I, but, but most Republicans do share values. It's just this group that is there now that is saying cut $40 billion out of, uh, of food stamps, cut slash uh, uh, head start, uh, cut uh, uh, why should you take away a tax break from big oil when you can save the same amount of money by cutting Pell Grants? And we need to do all this to reduce the deficit, but we can't touch one hair on the head of, of special interest and their tax breaks in the tax code. I, I think that the public uh, scrutiny of the debate, holding us all to the scrutiny, Democrats and Republicans alike, as to where this values debate goes. And, and again, we all have to compromise. Everybody knows that. But if they're saying there isn't any way we're gonna close one loophole, but you've gotta make Granny pay more for her Medicare, well, that's a debate the American people should see. Okay, so let's, let's step back from there because obviously you've been in this fight and leading this fight yeah. for, for your party for years. How many, after all these years in public service, what still gets you up in the morning? Do well, this. what gets me up in the morning to do this and what I think of as I go to sleep at night and pray for are the one in five children in America who live in poverty. Uh, I have five children, nine grandchildren. I see all the opportunity that they have and all the love and attention and that. And I think, why, why is it in our country that so many children uh, live in poverty, go to sleep hungry at night? Uh, we don't do any of our children any favor by saying that this is okay for them to grow up in a society uh, that has such a disparity of opportunity for children. So that's it. So when I'm talking to people, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, if they're standing in the way of those one in five kids, I choose, I love them all, okay. but I choose the children over them. And, and when you first got into public service, who inspired you the way that you inspire the young women that were at this conference today? Well, the, um, uh, my mother was a great inspiration to me. My father was an elected official when I was born. Uh, mayor. Right? He, he, well, I was born, he was the uh, member of Congress oh. uh, from Baltimore. And uh, then when I was in first grade, he became the mayor of Baltimore. And when I went away to college, in a freshman year in college, he was still the mayor of Baltimore. So uh, we all, public service was a noble calling in our family and our sense of responsibility uh, to the community was one that was instilled in us. I still had no interest myself in going into politics, but I knew that I had a responsibility. And so then uh, my husband, my husband's a born and raised San Franciscan, but we met in college. And so when I came out here, eventually I 
volunteered for other candidates, this or that, and became chair of the California Democratic Party, which I thought was the height of how great the biggest party, largest party in our country, and now I'm the chair of that. And then one thing led in another. Sala Burton, you know, Philip Burton's uh, widow. successor, mm -hmm. widow and successor, and John Burton's sister-in-law. When she was um, ill, she asked me to run. I never intended to run for public office, but she insisted, and I s promised her I would, and then, to our surprise, she soon passed away. So since I promised her I would run, and I did, I had to promise her that I would win, so, so I did. And that's, and that's how I went from the kitchen to the Congress. <laughs> mm -hmm. do, you, do you worry at all that because of sort of the corrosive nature of the debate that goes on right now, that we're not attracting people into public service, it's becoming a disincentive for people to participate? Well, I'm very impressed by the candidates who are coming forth for us for the next election and by the members of Congress. Our House Democratic Caucus is over 50 percent women, minorities, and LGBT community people, so I'm, I'm thrilled with that. But I will I agree with you that, the, the, that I, I said at the conference today, if you reduce the role of money in politics and you increase the level of civility, you'll attract more women, more young people, more minorities to take the chance to run. And that's what we should do. Our founders, they uh, l sacrificed their lives, their liberty, their sacred honor for a democracy, a government of the many. And now you've, uh, it's turning into a government of the money. We have to stop that. And, and I think that will, do, if we change that, it will be more to just have a, f a flowering of interest in running uh, for public office, inc including increasing the civility. Do you, do you think that, uh, that the, the presence of money in politics today really has, has changed kind of the absolutely. incentives? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. No. Uh, with the Supreme Court decision on Citizens United, it was probably one of the most detrimental uh, decisions to How our so? democracy. How well, so? because it's, it said you can have unlimited, not even, you don't even know where the money comes from, unlimited secret special interest money weighing in and for all the concern that we have about obstacles to participation that are being put up uh, for people uh, to make it harder for people to vote nothing suppresses the vote more than the suffocating impact of endless unidentified but don't par money. both parties have equal entree on mm. being able to get that money well, so it's kind of like of parody but well, no, there isn't parody but it doesn't matter even if democrats had more i still don't approve of it really i don't approve it i think we i've issued a dare disclose where's this money coming from and I don't mean disclose like some rich man says I gave a hundred million dollars to overturn the Affordable Care Act I mean let's see his name on an ad so when he does his confusing commercial misrepresenting the facts people can see whose name is on it so uh, disclose amend the Constitution to overturn Citizens United it has to be done it's a big thing to amend the Constitution but it is a mobilization that our country is ready for reform. We have uh, legislation to have uh, fair elections, which means that small donors will be rewarded, that everybody is significant in a campaign. And just because Mr. Big Bucks says he's going to put on millions of dollars, it doesn't turn off millions of other people from sending their $25 or whatever it happens to be. And, and, and then empower. Disclose, amend, reform, empower. And empower means to remove those obstacles of participation, including the oppressive uh, role of money in suppressing uh, the vote. And we have to deal, of course, with the Voting Rights Act that, and we, uh, issues like that that also contribute to um, um, tilting the, 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 uh, the ground. Project out in the future, uh, say 20 years, and if Citizens United doesn't get replaced, and if, in fact, um, there's another decision that's before well, the court I'm right now. I'm very afraid of it because this court doesn't understand the corrosive role of money what, in what does politics look like 20 years from now if, if all this, from your perspective, if both those Well, if we had our way, we would have a situation where we have uh, the empowerment of small donors and that campaigns would be largely uh, f uh, funded by small donors. And the, the, the rich special interest secret money, they weigh in but they're offset by small donors. But small donors have to know that their contribution is valued, and that's why it's important to match some of those contributions. And, and the thing that most people struggle with, Leader Pelosi, is that most folks feel that if 
big business is on the side of the Republican Party, that big labor is on the side of, of the Democrats, and so therefore it, it's kind of like mutually assured destruction that no one's really ahead. So what does it matter? Because it, the, the pie just grows bigger in terms of contributions. But your point is mm -hmm. that in fact, even if all of that money is present and it is at parity, voices are being stifled? Yes, voices are being stifled. Well, uh, you asked about the Affordable Care Act, a half a billion dollars being spent uh, to misrepresent what it was. We don't have that kind of money or that kind of time to raise that kind of money, and it isn't a good use of, it's an opportunity cost of time. But uh, I, I take issue with uh, the special interest uh, money, secret special interest money, getting all these tax breaks in the tax code uh, versus the representation of working men and women in our country. Uh, yes, the labor supports, not, not universally Democrats, but by and large Democrats, but the um, uh, collective bargaining is very important. What, what does labor stand for? Collective bargaining is very important uh, to our uh, economy and to fairness in our system. Uh, many of the things that some in business are proposing are fine ideas too, but they get tainted by a special interest, unlimited money, which uses, um, which uh, hijacks uh, what might seem to be, well, we're job creators. You're job creators, except that you want to suppress the vote. These are the same people who want to suppress the vote, oppose raising the minimum wage, overturn, uh, uh, not of support Citizens United, do not support the Affordable Care Act. So they're not there. I mean, uh, the way I tell people this is, uh, Toynbee, when he talked about the development of civilization and, and those that survived and those who did not, he talks about uh, the, what he called uh, the uh, creative minority. And those were the leaders who were there for the flowering of civilization, that they were there for the good of the people so that the people can flourish versus the exploitive minority who were there for power and money of the few at the expense of the many. And when uh, uh, societies got into that conflict, well, those who stayed with the first agenda flourished longer. Those who started with power and money or deteriorated to that, it caused a schism in society, a schism of the soul of what that country was but, about, but, that society was about. Mm -hmm. And that is what the power of money a is doing. A lot of people, though, feel that that schism exists today, but in a different way. And it's whether it's a Democrat or Democrats or Republicans, that the culture of Washington is elite, insulated, and doesn't really understand the woman who works in the diner, the guy who works as a policeman, the woman who works as a school teacher, yeah. and that their issues are not on the minds of folks who, you know, go to s fancy soirees and, well, you know, go back know, and forth. I agree with you that that may be what the public thinks. So It's I, not true? I, I don't go to fancy soirees, so I, I don't know. I, I, that is, I don't see that much of that in Washington. Okay. But you're right, people think that. They think that uh, we drink out of silver cups or something <laughs> like that, which isn't true. But I, I, I do know that it is the purpose of the Democratic Party to speak for those voices of those people who work hard, play by the rules, uh, uh, and want to achieve the American dream. And that's why we're gung-ho for the all out there for the immigration bill. We have to restore confidence in who we are as a country, to respond to you, who we are as a country, to restore confidence in our economy by creating jobs, good paying jobs for people, and paying a decent wage and not exploiting labor, but uh, uh, respecting labor. Is there a balance, though, between so, not exploiting labor uh, but also rewarding the, the entrepreneurs and creators? Absolutely. Well, that's, that, 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 that's not even a question. There's, one is not to the exclusion of the other. It's about entrepreneurship. That's what America, that's what America has public-private partnerships uh, to, um, uh, to reward the entrepreneurship of America. And, and that is, can be very disruptive, and it's a beautiful thing, that disruption. Mark. What's to, what is on your agenda? If, if, if the stars lined up, yeah. And you were able to push forward uh, your legislative agenda. Right. What would be the most critical thing for you to get done right now? Well, the first thing would be the creation of jobs. And we have it as simple as ABC. A, Amer make it in America, American made. B, build the infrastructure of America. It's deteriorating. It needs uh, repair or rebuilding, and it creates jobs. 
and grows our economy and see community, how we educate our children, protect our neighborhoods, uh, all of that springing from the community so that it's not coming from above. The ideas are coming from community. ABC, I would add my dare, mm -hmm. disclose, amend, reform, it because right. I don't think you can make these changes unless you make the change in the politics. Walter Ruther said, the bread box and the ballot box cannot be separated. So I would put that as an agenda. Now, having said that, jobs. Restore confidence in our economy by creation of jobs. Whether, and we do our budget. It has to be about growth and job creation. Secondly, I would restore confidence as who we are uh, as, as a, 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 a democracy, and that is to reduce the role of money in politics. Uh, and lastly? Then the next would be to restore confidence who we are as a people. Now, hopefully this will be done, and that is by and large a nation of immigrants with all love and respect for our Native American brothers and sisters or a nation of immigrants. We've got to correct that. And also restore safe, uh, confidence in the safety of our community by passing a background checks. And I think we're going to leave it right there. There we go. Leader Pelosi, When women thank succeed, you. America succeeds. All right. <laughs> From your you. lips to God's ear. <laughs> thank thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Scott. My pleasure. That's our show. Thanks to our guests, House Democratic Leader Nancy Pelosi, and thanks to you for watching Studio Sacramento. I'm Scott Syfax. See you next time right here mm -hmm. on KVIE. Five Star Bank community is at the heart of what we do. Every day we strive to have thoughtful solutions for our customers and help our communities prosper. Honest dialogue about the issues affecting the region is vitally important to that prosperity. We are proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. All episodes of Studio Sacramento, along with other KVIE programs, are available to watch online at kvie.org video.